welcome back to Block TV, where it is time for cryptonomics. The point in time where we look at the relation between the crypto market and the larger financial and political landscape. And it must be said, we are beginning to see more and more link, links of that kind. Now, I'm joined today in studio by Anif Feldman, an economist and partner in Juno Capital. Always so great to have you. Um, and today, actually, it's such a fabulous day to have him with us because the Fed chair announcement of yesterday dropped quite the uh, quite the speculation on the market. So um, uh, the Fed's chair announcement of a quarter percent cut to interest rates and the market's reactions to it um, uh, is what we're going to discuss. This is what Powell said yesterday. We are several hours past it. Let's have a listen. We decided today to lower the target for the federal funds rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2 percent to 2 and a quarter percent. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable and this action is designed to support that outlook. It is intended to ensure against downside risks from weak global growth and trade policy uncertainty, to help offset the effects these factors are currently having on the economy, and to promote a faster return of inflation to our symmetric 2 percent objective. All of these objectives will support achievement of our overarching goal to sustain the expansion with a strong job market and inflation close to our objective for the benefit of the American people. Per your statement here, I guess the question is, is there any reason to believe that a 25 basis point cut is going to be sufficient to expediently return inflation to your 2% target? <clears throat> and if not, what are you going to be looking at to convince you that you need to cut rates again? What is the hurdle right there? So I, I think you have to look at not, not just the 25 basis point cut, but look at the committee's actions over the course of the year. As I noted in my opening statement, um, uh, we, we started off expecting some rate increases. We moved to a patient setting for a few months, and now we've moved here. And I think what you've seen over the course of the year is as we've moved to a more accommodative policy, the, the economy has actually performed just about as expected with that gradually increasing support. And I think I wouldn't take credit for all of that, but I do think that increasing policy support has, has kept the economy on track and kept the, the outlook favorable. Um, in terms of uh, the, the rest of your question, the committee is really thinking of, of this as, uh, as a way of adjusting policy to a somewhat more accommodative stance to further the three objectives that I mentioned, to um, ensure against uh, downside risks, to, to provide support to the economy, that those factors are, uh, f where, where factors are, are, pushing, are, are pushing down on economic growth, and then to support inflation. So we do think it will serve all of those goals. But again, we're thinking of it as essentially in the nature of a mid-cycle adjustment to policy. Joined in studio by Yaniv Feldman of Juno um, uh, Capital. Now, Yaniv, first of all, before we talk about if at all any effect, what is that projected in the cryptocurrency market, why would the Fed do this? If I'm arguing now that side that says the American economy supposedly is robust. It's doing well. Unemployment rates are, are low. Um, why do this? Because this is something people do when the economy has stands the chance to slow down and you want to give it a boost. So basically, you know, that depends, as an economist, that depends on your, your school of thought. You know, exactly. there's, there's the uh, Keynesian economists that uh, go by uh, government interference in the markets and managing the markets and try to keep them sustained and in balance. And there's the Austrian economist, the, the opposite way. I'm not, I'm leaving MMT and all the popular theories aside for a second, but these are the two opposite sides where the Austrian uh, uh, school of thought says, you know, the the one that knows how the market should behave is the market. Is the market. There's, there's Let no it be one, organic. There's no one that should interfere. And what happens is right now is that the market, you know, they're in a, I would say a pretend um, a pretend phase of growth. There have been that way, I think, ever since around 2015, 2016, uh, where the bubble should have popped. I mean, we had like eight, nine years of sustained growth post-economic post crisis. Post-2008. And, and, right. And then, you know, you started seeing all the signs that, that the market is imbalanced again. And, the, you know, again, depends on how you look at that. 
but the best way for that to do is to let the air vent out, to let debt levels you know, go back to normal, uh, which would mean collapsing of some financial institutions and the air needed to go out some, some way or another. What the US government and the uh, uh, US economic institutions chose to do is keep inflating it. I mean, the only way to sustain uh, a, a bubble right. is to keep putting more and more air in. Uh, other way, I I any other way would just, you know, pop out or, you know, just go back to what it used to be. And that's what happens right How now. And that's what happened manipulate. since Trump came to power. I mean, his, uh, 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 his flag was, you know, I'm going to make America great again. And as a part of that, you know, he needs to uh, uh, sustain the economy. And where it was when he started, the only way he could do that is with rate cuts and all the other uh, 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 monetary instruments that he and the Fed has in their power um, in order to sustain that. And what they're doing is just putting a, a mask or a blanket uh, on top of everything that's going on underneath the surface. Um, eventually, yeah. Let's let's let's. What what are the risks of that? Before we touch on, you know, eventually, what can happen? So how long can this be done? The, 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 uh, there are, I would say, two main risks. One is uh, local to the U.S., the way, the way I see it, and the other is, is global. Um, the first one is U.S., again, not in a standard way, but U.S. defaulting on, on its own debt. On its own debt. Uh, it could happen, you know, from the um, rising consumer debt, the... Uh, incredibly high consume, uh, commercial debt where companies just won't be able to pay back their bonds or, or just the treasury, uh, uh, you know, the, the, they won't be able to pay their own debt besides money that they print themselves, which will make which an makes increased inflation <laughs> and yeah. the money losing more of its value and them not being able to pay. The, so eventually, you know, that's, that's one, uh, uh, one big danger uh, that's, you know, just, uh, looting. yeah, just looting above our heads. The second is that due to that nature, what will happen is that other countries, other major financial economies would lose faith in the dollar. And that would cause the dollar to lose its place as the global reserve, reserve currency, which, which many could people lead, in this sphere are waiting for. Uh, yeah. Again, if I, if I go to, uh, uh, the, the, um, if, if I take the optimist hat, you know, many people are waiting for that, meaning that the dollar will lose its place. It's due to happen. No other fiat currency system has lasted over 100 years. That's the longest fiat currency system that, that has held so far. Um, and, you know, people are looking what's the currency that's going to take its place as, uh, as a global reserve, if at all. Will it be back to gold? We maybe, hopefully, Bitcoin. Or will there be any other uh, or something uh, else? Exactly. Fiat currency like the, the yuan or or uh, uh, the Japanese yen or yeah. the euro or, or it's not going to be the pound. That's it. Probably <laughs> not. But then again, you know, if if Trump maintains that yeah. level for a few more years before we see the meltdown, maybe the UK can bounce back. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, and then we're just because we're taping this at the you know the, the, this bizarre not bizarre but quite expected um, uh, um, Brexit day. Days of Brexit. I want to talk though. Still, no, staying with sticking with the Fed. It had some effect on gold. Um, uh, that's the only thing that I saw. It didn't really affect the markets. Neither did it affect the cryptocurrency markets. Or, or is it too early to say that? Should we wait another, let's say, forty-eight, seventy-two hours for the weekend to pass? So, so you know, we we used to seeing markets react, you know, drastically rather soon after announcements like this or or other events that happen. But we have to remember a couple of things. One is that the cryptocurrency market is still rather young True. and the players that are playing it are not the traditional players that react to these kind of statements. Two uh, is that these kind of things, again, they take time. I mean, we don't really know how is that going to affect long term. 
And I think that Bitcoin specifically, I'm not discussing the entire market no, for no, that yeah, matter, specific. Is, is still rather early in its life cycle to be considered a safe haven for, for a store of wealth. There are a lot of, you know, Ray Dalio said that and, and a lot of other uh, uh, traditional investors are, are still doubting and, and Again, it's not that it's not a store of value. It's just, it's just not it's perceived not, not as such enough. Exactly. Yeah. And when something like that happens, people tend to liquidate the riskiest asset and try to uh, uh, move back to what is perceived by them as the safest. Which still as, is as at this safest. point in time, gold. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, gold, real estate, Eight, basically right. anything that would not be affected by inflation, uh, not you know in the traditional way. And Bitcoin, unfortunately, is not there yet. I mean, in a couple of years, five years, 10 years, yes. You're right. uh, but now it will be difficult. I think that the early adopters of Bitcoin, both uh, uh, retail and institutions, are ripely you know, in place to benefit from, from that misconception of yeah. the general public. Uh, we are seeing movements, we are seeing accumulation, you know, in the last um, eight, nine months, we are seeing actual accumulation by institutions uh, that are coming in. I specifically know of four yeah. or five countries wow. that are accumulating Bitcoin, uh, in some of in. them in, in, in experimental purposes, but some are actual buying for their reserves. So. Apropos institutional investments, um, uh, actually, before we touch on uh, whatever's going on on Capitol Hill, Ledger X surprised everybody yesterday. Yeah. Um, that it was um, uh, revealing that it was beginning to offer Bitcoin futures. All eyes are backed. We've been reporting on it, but the expectance of it going to be into back. But Ledger X managed to push this out faster. First of all, what does this mean a for Ledger X shippo? But what does it mean for future institutional investors? So basically, the, the idea of um, physical uh, delivery futures is something that exists in the institutional world for a lot of years. Yes. What what it does is it basically makes the market, it makes the future market more connected to the actual market. Because what the CME had what, what, when it was cash settled was just basically gambling on Bitcoin's price. Right now, you would actually have to buy or sell. Uh, in order to to to, uh, to, to fulfill the right. orders uh, uh, of the futures, which would increase the volume, it would increase regular uh, 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 regulation on the markets, and would definitely help um, help the Bitcoin market evolve and make it more compliant towards institution. I think that you know, uh, Beck is still on track to launch yeah. in, in, in later this year, and I think that. You know, LedgerX is a smaller company. It moves faster. Uh, uh, they got the approval from the CFTC a little faster. Uh, so, you know, again, chapeau for them. But uh, I think that Beckett, again, because of it, its relationships with ICE right. and all the institutional uh, environment around ICE, uh, would, be, would, be, would be a bigger splash a than Ledger X. But again, everything is welcome and I wish them all like best of luck and I think that they will all bring good things to the market. Even though, you know, if you remember when the futures launched back in November 2017, that's what started uh, uh, the boom, uh, the, the, the boom yeah. of, of the market. No, look, we were expecting when Bact announced for prices to go up uh, or apropos ledger yesterday, we're not seeing that. There is no reaction. So, so again, these these are uh, the market is is behaving um, rather detached from from, from events, yeah, from events. In, in general. I think that there is a lot of price action going on in the market where you see the prices are trying to break nine thousand, ninety five hundred. Um, and, and they're trying to break up the 10K barrier back. Right. And there are a lot of pushbacks back and forth in the market right now. So it's very hard for events uh, uh, unless, you know, they convince uh, a strong institutional buyer to put in a lot of money and, and just jump the price back up or down. Uh, so because the, the, the price kind of find its equilibrium, which is very healthy for the market right now, especially, you know, going forward towards the halving next year. Right. Uh, we need that balance uh, after the last, you know, six months where the price just jumped back up 
and down yeah. uh, from 14K. So we need, that, uh, uh, we need that balance in order to make the market more fundamental and less speculative. Less speculative and more, yeah, more, more actual, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, so, so again, we, we're not seeing the uh, direct uh, influence of events, but we are seeing them underneath. We are seeing infrastructure, we are seeing players coming in, which will be what sustains the next the next uh, demo. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, finally, I want to talk about another, um, uh, another week of uh, fun on uh, Capitol Hill. Needless to say, another hearing um, uh, the, um, um, once again by the, by the Banking Committee, same chairman, Mr. Crapo. But not only that, um, uh, you know, the expansion, so to speak, of a look at the cryptocurrency market. They want to paint a uh, you know, wider brush than just Libra. Wasn't as sexy as the David Marcus um, uh, hearing. <laughs> no. Um, ex exactly. But, um, uh, you know, I want your thoughts on it because one thing came out clear is that I want to say lack of education, but let's hear Chairman Crapo um, uh, from that hearing break it down right after. Help me understand if, if a digital currency is to become global, like Libra seeks to be, uh, how does it do that? How does it get global acceptance if it faces 190 different countries with different jurisdictional issues and different regulatory systems? And maybe another way to ask my question is, if the United States were to decide, and I'm not saying that it should, but if the United States were to decide we didn't want cryptocurrency to happen in the United States and tried to ban it, I'm, I'm pretty confident we couldn't succeed in doing that because this is a global, tech, a global innovation. But how would, a, how would a company that wants to create a cryptocurrency that has global reach get into the United States, or how would that impact the United States? You see, you see the question I'm asking? I'm happy to take part of that, Senator. Um, you know, I, I think the, the challenge that we all face with this is, uh, you know, th th some of these cryptocurrencies are, they're literally just a piece of open source software. There's nothing else. It exists on the Internet. It's open source software. Anyone can implement it. It runs anywhere the Internet runs. Okay, Circle co-founder the you know, was the man in the in the hot seat, but it, the one thing I gleaned from those hearings was a that I think they finally got it on Capitol Hill that they cannot ban crypto. I think that's one thing they <laughs> yeah, understand. That, that's, that, that's, that was an important statement. Yeah. Yes, but I don't think they get much more. Are they moving even fast enough? Um, Again, the, there are a lot of uh, conversations right now on, on regulatory environment in the U.S. and whether or not it, it cripples or, or not um, the industry. Again, to my opinion and my familiarity with other regulators, I think that uh, U.S. regulators are one of the more advanced uh, uh, yeah. in the world in that sense, maybe besides Japan, uh, Switzerland, that's pretty much it. I think all the other, you know, small territories are doing what they're doing in order to get, you know, regulatory arbitrage advantage. Right. But I think that the U.S. takes things very seriously. I think that the problem is with politics in general and with politics in the U.S. specifically is that most of these people are from the older generation. These are people who have a hard time of accepting technology and everything evolve, revolving around it. And on top of that, you're basically telling them that economy, the way it worked, the way they know it is going to change. That's something that's very Scary. hard for people to exist. I know that you know when I uh, 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 talked with family offices and high net worth individuals, and I tell them, "Hey guys, look at the asset. Look at what it did for the last ten years. Look at look at it, lack of correlation." Um, and, and I explain how it works and why it could be a hedge in case of. And I say, "Look, look, put like." 50 basis points on that. If it goes to zero, it won't damage your portfolio, but if something really happens, it could be what saves your portfolio and even makes you know, uh, uh, some good yeah. yield. And the, the problem is with that pitch is that even if you, you, know, you accept the idea of putting 50%, 50 basis points in an uncorrelated asset, the thought of what that means for the other 99.5% of your portfolio 
is just uncomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So people are just not willing to make that, you know, trade. Switch. It's no, it's a, it's, exactly. it's a switch of thought. Exactly. In many ways, but I, you know, I'll venture and say before we conclude that I, I, most likely world events and probably in the near future market events will force people to make that switch. Um, yeah. Yanni yeah, Feldman, always such a pleasure for shedding a light, a very, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, a very understandable light on all the issues we dealt with this week. This was Cryptonomics. Block TV will be right back. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.